in a very simple PDF format so that you just see four on a page and that hopefully if you are printing them, it's not too much printing. But what I will be doing today is working from the actual PowerPoint presentations and you will then see why we are so concerned with the decolonization and Africanization of constitutional law, because you will notice that the identity, the culture, the values of the indigenous African inhabitants were so severely undermined that the colonizers, the settlers, if you want to call them that, were able to systematically deny all Africans of any political power. And not just deny them the political power, but exploit, it, abuse and subjugate the African majority. And it is that context that we need to know in order to understand why we have the constitution that we do. So I'm now going to begin the slideshow and we will discuss it as we go. All right, so I'm going to share my screen. Uh, Mildred, do you have a question? Yes, ma'am. I was wondering if it's possible to mute everybody from your side because there's still people who have their mics on. It's a I can definitely try. <laughs> uh, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I say that because I always think I know how to work this and then I don't. Um, Um, I, I'm, I'm in meeting options, but I don't see. OK, let me. Um, is, is everyone muted now or can you not? You're muted. That's Makadi. Is everyone muted? So if you try to answer, um, sorry, sorry, okay. sorry, Miss Lee. Sorry, yes. Miss Lee. Um, I'd yes. like to know, is this the prescribed textbook or is it um, the study guide? This sorry, but like from the prescribed textbook. Prescribed. Yes. Oh, okay. And Thank you. I I've added to it just to make it more relevant and interesting and show you how chronologically, so over a period of time, the constitutional system in South Africa developed the way it did and necessitated the, I'm going to have to say, armed resistance to apartheid because that will become apparent later on. So look, I can't see where I can mute everyone. I don't seem to have an option like that. So I'm just going to assume that everyone will stay muted and hope that we don't have any interference. So I'm going, as I say, I'm going to share my, well, share my screen in the form of a slideshow. And so you have seen all of this, but but I, I'd like us to discuss it um, as we go. In fact, let me. Uh, sorry, I'm going to. Um, just. Escape and. Do that so that I can hopefully save data. Tabojo, you have a question? Tabojo Lebelo? Hi, I'm not sure if it's my network, but I can't really hear you properly. I'm not sure if I'm the only um, one. Well, you do sound very crackly 
Um, so I'm not sure if. Okay, can... I'll try. And for everyone else, can you hear me clearly? Yes, we can, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma uh, I can so hear you. Fourth, it's probably your, on your side. So let us then begin where we were. All right. So, all right. So, um okay oh is is can everyone hear me now yes, yes ma'am okay i had interference because i had teams on my phone phone as well all right so chapter one of the textbook is the chapter that gives us all the context we need to understand and know in order to appreciate the definitions in chapter two because remember chapter two will deal with those fundamental concepts that are integral to constitutional law being democracy rule of law constitutionalism separation of powers if you do not understand those concepts you will struggle to understand constitutional law but in addition to those concepts, you also need to understand South Africa's history so that you can identify whether we as a country are actually moving forward in terms of our constitutional aspirations. So are we living according to what the Constitution says? So I have this diagram that shows the cogs all turning and that there's a, an interrelationship. That is because you need to know that. And I I mean, the, the list I have here is not even a closed list. South Africa's constitutional system as we know it today. Has to be understood firstly because of your understanding of politics. So how does the political situation in a country determine the constitution? What are the ideologies underpinning the constitutional system? And um, so, of course, during apartheid, the freedom fighters were always accused of being communists as though that was the most heinous crime. But the, on the other hand, the ideology of the apartheid um, power was su suppression of the individual's humanity. Sociology is also very relevant to constitutional law. And what we mean by that is that the whole notion of race, for example, is a socially constructed concept. There actually is no real definition of race. To explain that, during colonization in South Africa, the Afrikaners and the English would refer to each other as being of different races. It's only later on that ethnicity became a factor that was used to segregate white from black. So this whole idea of race is, is a socially constructed concept, and we need to understand that because if it's a socially constructed concept, we can socially deconstruct it if at all that is possible um, in South Africa, but that is the objective. That's why I have there underlined that we have a transformative constitution. What the intenders, the intention of the writers of our constitution are, is 
that we have full legal, political, social, economic transformation that means we are all equal, valuable, worthy human beings. So having said that we have a transformative constitution, you of course have to understand first and foremost what a constitution is. And the general definition is that it's a blueprint. So like a plan, it's a plan of action that sets out how the state is going to function most effectively and sets out, as you see, the ground rules or the, the, the fundamental principles. And in the context of South Africa in particular, we call our constitution a living document because I, this was mentioned last week, that when you open the constitution to read it, you will realize that the provisions themselves do not contain much detail. And it is up to our courts to interpret and apply the constitution. And in that way, they give the constitution meaning and they actually bring it to life so that it does give meaningful effect to the dreams and hopes of the persons who had fought so severely against apartheid, advocating for democracy, and who now had created a new constitution for this country. So the fundamental premises upon which the constitution is founded is that it provides for the authority of the state. So that is the document that says that the sovereign republic of South Africa has the power to create a fully functioning state. And in order for it to do that, it then takes it goes a step further by saying the state has to be structured in a certain way and the accepted structure in constitutional terms is to have the three principal organs of state. And you know by now that that is the legislature, executive and judiciary. But it not only creates these principal organs, it also has to clearly and precisely dictate exactly what the powers of those who are elected to hold positions within the legislature or who assume their position in the executive are constrained by, so that it limits powers to ensure that there is no abuse of power. So the branches of the state are given powers and all other independent Independent institutions, institutions that have been created in terms of the constitution are also given power. But as number four says, it ensures that there are clear limits on these powers. So I then wanted to locate our discussion this week in relation to last week's lecture so that you don't you, you you see the relationship and so this is just a cover of a book called decolonizing the mind by a kenyan author ngugi wationgo and why that's relevant is because i've quoted ngugi wationgo here and it's relevant it's relevant because it shows us that as a living document, the constitution is open-ended. So there isn't always only one correct interpretation of a provision, but in general, it is this constitution that is supposed to convey 
the majority's wishes, desires, and interests in society. So Ngugi Wationgo says, communication, and here I'm say, I'm I'm implying that it's communication between the courts and the the, the population, but also between human beings. He says this communication is the basis of an evolving culture. So if we keep communicating with each other with the intention of minimizing any disagreements or misunderstandings, we will end up hopefully in agreement. In law, we call it being ad idem. You are completely in agreement with each other about what is the culture that we intend to create in South Africa. And that culture, we call it the legal culture that we're trying to create. It is a gradual accumulation of values. So values being freedom, equality, dignity, Ubuntu. And these become self-evident truths. So there's no need for me to have to tell anyone else, I have a right to dignity. Other people must realize we all have the right to dignity and freedom and equality and freedom of expression, which is what the Constitution says. But moreover, hopefully, if there is this agreement between everyone, about our common legal culture. They will then develop an appreciation of what is right and wrong in society. And so I relate that to last week's lecture where we said if Ubuntu, for example, is not adhered to and we don't have compassion for each other, we don't regard each other as of equal worth, the result would be anarchy, complete and ungovernable society.